Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we save our begging until the end of the video. You're welcome. United States history is not terribly long compared to much of the world. After all, it is a young country. But in terms of overall suffering, the nation has really tried to do its part to contribute to humanity's misery. Our series examining the worst events, state by state, continues with a look into Michigan. It might have once been the center of automobile manufacturing, but it was also home to rebellion, murder, and natural disasters. Let's begin with the story of how Michigan tried to invade Canada. The Patriot War Michigan became a state on January 26, 1837. Less than a year later, it would become the base of operations for a rebellion in Canada. Within Canada, armed uprisings began taking place. Those who took up arms against the government desired a representative democracy. They didn't want to owe allegiance to a king or queen. In December 1837, the first attempt was made to overthrow the British monarchy in Canada. The rebellion was defeated. Several of the movement's leaders retreated into the United States. The former organizers began recruiting members into secret groups called Hunter's Lodges. When the moment was right, the militia planned to cross into Canada. Rather than depose the British, they planned to take territory from Canada and make it part of the United States. The next attack took place on November 13, 1838. Forces traveled into Prescott trying to capture the town. A battle raged for several days, but eventually the British used artillery to defeat the invading force. On December 4, 1838, another armed group departed for Michigan. They took a steamship into Canada and landed near Windsor. The British forces soon engaged them in battle. Both sides suffered casualties, but the rebellion was again defeated. Those who could flee disappeared into the forest. After escaping to Michigan, the militia planned to make another attempt to invade Canada. The United States military became aware of their plans and stopped it from happening. The British captured several prisoners during the two battles. Some were Canadian and others were United States citizens. They were all sentenced to life imprisonment in the Australian penal colonies. The Metz Fire in the early 1900s, Presque Isle County had less than 9,000 residents. Most of them worked on farms. There were a few mines. And the lumber industry was booming. But disaster was lurking just around the corner. In 1908, the first part of the year was unusually wet. The winter brought heavy snowfall. When spring arrived, downpours became common. But as the seasons changed into fall, the rain stopped. Conditions were very dry and water was scarce. On October 22nd, a fire started in the forest. Nobody knows what caused it. Workers might have tossed lit cigarettes into the underbrush. A train might have thrown sparks as it drove by. Perhaps somebody lit a fire on purpose. However, it started the wind suddenly changed direction. It began blowing hard in the direction of Metz. The growing forest fire became larger and began moving faster. Residents were warned of the approaching flames. They gathered their possessions and boarded a train. The train would take them away from the fire and hopefully to safety. The lumber industry tended to work close to the train tracks. Wood products that were left there caught fire and melted the tracks. The passengers only became aware of this fact when their train derailed. Several of the passengers were trapped and burned alive. One of the train conductors jumped in a water storage tank trying to avoid being burnt. Instead, he boiled to death. The fire didn't completely stop until late October. It killed 42 people, displaced thousands of families, and destroyed 200,000 acres of forest. The event is still one of the worst fires in Michigan history. 1967 Detroit Riot Starting around 1910, African Americans began migrating from the Deep South to other parts of the United States. One of the places where these groups settled was Detroit, Michigan. 
By the 1960s, black residents were a growing minority. They represented 30% of the population of Detroit, but the police and political leadership were 90% white. Discrimination was a widespread and pervasive problem. Black people were not allowed to buy homes in nice areas. So although many of them had money, they had to live in dangerous parts of town. The police were also aggressive in dealing with the African Americans that inhabited the city. Groups of young men were stopped and searched for no reason except that they were black. Black women who were walking down the street were frequently accused of being prostitutes as well. Since African American residents couldn't go to the better parts of town, they created their own places for entertainment. After hours, drinking clubs became a common feature in the black areas of Detroit. But by the late 1960s, authorities would start to crack down on those too. In the early hours of July 23, 1967, police raided an unlicensed drinking club. They expected to only find a few people there. Instead, there was a party of 82 people. Detroit police arrested all of them. As the patrons of the establishment were being arrested, a crowd of onlookers gathered. They became increasingly angry and agitated. The mob began breaking windows and looting businesses. Before long, riots spread all over the city. The violence only increased on July 24th. Police responded by arresting thousands of looters, but they couldn't stop the violence. Before the day was over, there would be 483 fires. There were 231 criminal events per hour. Authorities simply couldn't keep up. By July 25th, the situation was getting even worse. Police were overworked and began committing acts of violence against those who had already been arrested. President Lyndon Johnson approved the use of federal troops to crush the violence. Their arrival did not immediately improve the situation. Although nobody was ever prosecuted for shooting at troops, at least 7,000 people were arrested on suspicion of being snipers. In one case, the National Guard thought they were taking sniper fire. They responded by firing hundreds of rounds into the building. In the process, a four-year-old girl was killed. It later turned out that someone was lighting a cigarette and the troops mistakenly thought it was incoming fire. The riots finally ended on July 28th. 43 people died and more than 7,200 were arrested. Mayor Jerome Cavanaugh surveyed the damage and commented, Today we stand amidst the ashes of our hopes. We hoped against hope that what we had been doing was enough to prevent a riot. It was not enough. The Great 1986 Flood Although Michigan can experience extreme cold during winter months, it is quite warm during the summer. As the seasons transition from summer to fall, the southern part of the state usually sees cooler temperatures and calmer weather. Residents were not prepared for the storms that appeared late on September 9, 1986. The storms had arrived from the Midwest. However, a front pushing down from the Great Lakes prevented them from moving north. The storm systems remained above Michigan for two days. They extended 180 miles long east to west and 60 miles long north to south. Throughout the day and night of September 10th, at least 14 inches of rain dropped onto the southern part of the state. Although the worst of it only lasted a day, the rain did not stop until September 12th. The city of Vassar was just one of many places that experienced severe flooding. The excessive rain caused a nearby river to rise and dump excessive water into the community. It happened so quickly that some of the residents awoke to find that their vehicles were beneath water. In some cases, the streets were flooded, which trapped the victims in their homes. Over 100 people were injured. At least 10 died in the rushing waters. The body of a hunter was discovered on the bank of one river. One woman accidentally drove her car into the rushing water and disappeared. In one instance, two children were playing in a stream. Floodwaters poured into the small channel and washed them away. A few victims were in boats when the floodwaters arrived. They were tossed overboard and drowned. Two men were electrocuted to death while trying to pump water out of their basements. 
The death toll kept climbing after the waters receded. The flood washed away crops from most of the fields. Two farmers who were emotionally and financially devastated by the loss dealt with it by committing suicide. In total, the natural disaster caused about $1 billion in damages. At least 30,000 homes were damaged. Thousands of miles of roads became impassable, and 11 dams failed. It remains one of the worst natural disasters in Michigan history. John Eric Armstrong The state of Michigan has also been home to some depraved killers. John Eric Armstrong was born on November 23, 1973 in New Bern, North Carolina. He had a younger brother. The infant died of sudden infant death syndrome at two months old in 1978. Soon after, John tried to kill himself. His father dealt with the tragedy by abandoning the family. John wasn't a well-adjusted teenager either. In 1989, he was hospitalized after locking himself in a bathroom and refusing to come out. The reason he was so upset is because a girl tried to pressure him into having sex. He joined the U.S. Navy in 1992. Between 1993 and 1998, investigators believe that John Armstrong killed at least 11 women. They were all prostitutes. Over the course of his military career, John supposedly killed women in Seattle, Hawaii, Hong Kong, North Carolina, Virginia, Thailand, and Singapore. Sometime after leaving the Navy in 1999, John settled down in the Detroit area. By early 2000, police noticed that women were turning up dead at an unprecedented rate. On January 2, 2000, the police in Dearborn received a call from John. He wanted to report that he found a dead woman in the river. When the police questioned John, he told them that he just stumbled upon it. They eventually let him go. On April 10th, several bodies were found near some railroad tracks. In total, there were three women in various stages of decomposition. All the victims had been strangled. Police had no luck finding the killer. However, it would turn out that John Armstrong was not the most competent murderer. On April 2nd, he tried to kill a prostitute that got into his jeep. She sprayed mace in his eyes, then ran away. On April 7th, he paid a male prostitute and tried to strangle him to death, too. The men struggled with John and finally escaped. Soon thereafter, he called police and told them that John was the culprit. On April 12th, DNA evidence finally proved that John Armstrong was the Detroit killer. He was arrested and charged with four murderers. During the subsequent interrogation, he confessed to the crimes. He explained that he liked to hire prostitutes, have sex with them, then kill them. But he didn't stop there. He would position the bodies and leave them. Then he would return and have sex with them again whenever he wanted. John Eric Armstrong was convicted of murder in 2001. He is unsurprisingly still in prison today. If you enjoyed these sordid tales from Michigan history, we have covered other events from this state in previous episodes. You might also enjoy Bad Things Happened in 1927. In it, we discuss the Bath School Disaster. A disgruntled farmer became angry and planted dynamite in the building. Is there anything else in Michigan history that we should have covered? If so, let us know in the comments below. If you have made it this far, then we would like to ask you a favor. We make new episodes every week and almost never take a vacation. For this channel to grow, it needs help from viewers like you. Please, hit the like button for this video. While you're at it, do it for all our episodes that interest you, if you're feeling generous. And if you have a thought in your head at all, please share it in the comments. All these things help convince YouTube that this channel is worth watching. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.